If you could invite any guest, both alive or dead, to your dinner party, who would you invite? I've been asked this question many times at many different points of my life. As I grew up, my fantasy guest list kept changing, except for one person, Albert Einstein. I was obsessed with the theory of relativity when I was in middle school. It followed from the special theory of relativity that mass and energy are both are but different manifestations of the same thing. I still remember spending that sunny afternoon in that rundown library in my village devouring a children-friendly book about Albert Einstein and his theory of relativity. In a way, I could argue that afternoon in that library was instrumental in shaping my thought process. Albert Einstein proved to me that I didn't have to live confined to any box. Growing up in India meant that along with learning about scientists, artists and philosophers from all over the world, I also learned about their Indian counterparts and it is inevitable for every Indian to have crossed paths with Rabindranath Tagore, one of the greatest Indian poets and philosophers. A striking difference that I noticed between Indian philosophers and their western counterparts is their views on spirituality and the nature of existence itself. It is not uncommon for Indian scientists and philosophers to be spiritual or even religious in some cases. Take Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam for example. The concept of the abstract is not foreign to Indian culture. Even ancient Indian scriptures talk about concepts like non-linear time and cause causing itself. So, I was always curious about the meeting of these two worlds, not just the east meets west aspect of it, but also logic and reasoning meeting the abstract and the unknowable. So imagine my surprise when I came to know of a recorded conversation between Albert Einstein and Rabindranath Tagore. Tagore was brought up in the Brahmo tradition. His father was a well-known preacher of this tradition. Brahmoism can be described as a unitarian religion. It acknowledges one Advaita Param Brahma, a formless eternal creator. Tagore, however, broke out of the rather puritanical perspective imposed by his father. He embraced a broader mysticism. In his play Achalayatan, Tagore created a character Dada Thakur, probably Tagore expressing his personality. Dada Thakur is a free spirit who has a joyous and direct relationship with the divine, rejecting a narrow rule and ritual bound existence. Albert Einstein, on the other hand, was a secular Jew, but he never took religion very seriously. In fact, Einstein once said, I do not believe in a personal God, and I have never denied this, but have expressed it clearly. If something is in me which can be called religious, then it is the unbounded admiration for the structure of the world, so far as our science can reveal it. He also said, the word God is for me nothing more than the expression and product of human weaknesses. The Bible, a collection of honorable but still primitive legends which are nevertheless pretty childish. But Einstein talked a lot about God. He invoked God repeatedly in his physics, so much so that his friend Niels Bohr once berated him for constantly telling God what he could do. For an outside observer, it would seem that these two men have little in common. But even apart from the fact that they were both Nobel Prize winners, Tagore for literature and Einstein for physics, they actually had a lot more in common. How incredible it is for us then that these two great men at the opposite ends of the spectrum met and had a wonderfully complex conversation about our existence, reality, divine and everything in between. The conversation was reported in the New York Times on 10th August 1930 with the headline Einstein and Tagore Plumb the Truth and was also published in the magazine The Modern Review. The article read, Atop the hill, Tagore sat down in an armchair on the lawn with Einstein and his family to enjoy the scene. Then he spoke of his last visit to London and his lecture on religion and humanity. A lively discussion arose. It was interesting to see them together. Tagore the poet with the head of a thinker, and Einstein the thinker with the head of a poet. Tagore's hair is smooth and silver grey, as is his long beard. His head is usually bent forward and the eyes are sunken. He is visibly absorbed in his mystical world. Every expression of his delicate face, every passing phrase bears the mark of concentration. He speaks with a majestic tranquility, as though reciting a poem or delivering a sermon. His slim fingers speak too and supplement the gleam of his eyes, which in spite of his 70 years light up in a youthful way. Einstein's hair is also grey. It seems to stand as though electrified and then to hang, as that of the old Romans did, in curls upon his powerful head. 
Einstein listened with studious attention, then gave his characteristic view. Neither sought to press his opinion. They simply exchanged ideas. But it seemed to an observer as though two planets were engaged in a chat. And so, without further ado, the conversation. Tagore says, You have been busy hunting down with mathematics the two ancient entities, time and space, while I have been lecturing in this country on the eternal world of man, the universe of reality. Einstein asks, Do you believe in the divine isolated from the world? Not isolated, the infinite personality of man comprehends the universe. There cannot be anything that cannot be subsumed by the human personality. And this proves that the truth of the universe is human truth. There are two different conceptions about the nature of the universe. One, the world as a unity dependent on humanity. And two, the world as reality independent of the human factor. When our universe is in harmony with man, the eternal, we know it as truth, we feel it as beauty. This is a purely human conception of the universe. There can be no other conception. The world is a human world. The scientific view of it is also that of a scientific man. Therefore, the world apart from us does not exist. It's a relative world depending for its reality upon our consciousness. There is some standard of reason and enjoyment which gives it truth, the standard of the eternal man whose experiences are made possible through our experiences. This is a realization of the human entity. Yes, one eternal entity. We have to realize it through our emotions and activities. We realize the supreme man who has no individual limitations through our limitations. Science is concerned with that which is not confined to individuals. It is the impersonal human world of truths. Religion realizes these truths and links them up with our deeper needs. Our individual consciousness of truth gains universal significance. Religion applies values to truth. And we know truth as good through our own harmony with it. Truth then, or beauty, is not independent of man. No, I do not say so. If there were no human beings anymore, the Apollo Belvedere no longer would be beautiful. No. I agree with this conception of beauty but not with regard to truth. Why not? Truth is realized through men. I cannot prove my conception is right, but that is my religion. Beauty is in the ideal of perfect harmony, which is in the universal being. Truth is the perfect comprehension of the universal mind. We individuals approach it through our own mistakes and blunders, through our accumulated experience, through our illumined consciousness. How otherwise can we know truth? I cannot prove, but I believe in the Pythagorean argument that the truth is independent of human beings. It's the problem of the logic of continuity. Truth, which is one with the universal being, must be essentially human. Otherwise, whatever we individuals realize as true never can be called truth. At least the truth which is described as scientific and which can only be reached through the process of logic, in other words, by an organ of thought which is human, According to the Indian philosophy, there is Brahman, the absolute truth, which cannot be conceived by the isolation of the individual mind or described by words, but can be realized only by merging the individual in its infinity. But such a truth cannot belong to science. The nature of truth which we are discussing is an appearance, that is to say, what appears to be true to the human mind, and therefore is human, and may be called maya or illusion. It is no illusion of the individual, but of the species. The species also belongs to a unity, to humanity. Therefore, the entire human mind realizes truth. The Indian and the European mind meet in a common realization. The word species is used in German for all human beings. As a matter of fact, even the apes and the frogs would belong to it. The problem is whether truth is independent of our consciousness. What we call truth lies in the rational harmony between the subjective and the objective aspects of reality, both of which belong to the superpersonal man. We do things with our mind, even in our everyday life, for which we are not responsible. The mind acknowledges realities outside of it, independent of it. For instance, nobody may be in this house, yet that table remains where it is. Yes, it remains outside the individual mind, but not the universal mind. The table is that which is perceptible by some kind of consciousness we possess. 
If nobody were in the house, the table would exist all the same, but this is already illegitimate from your point of view, because we cannot explain what it means that the table is here, independently of us. Our natural point of view in regard to the existence of truth apart from humanity cannot be explained or proved, but it is a belief which nobody can lack, not even primitive beings. We attribute to truth a superhuman objectivity. It is indispensable for us. This reality which is independent of our existence and our experience and our mind, though we cannot say what it means. Science has proved that the table as a solid object is an appearance, and therefore that which the human mind perceives as a table would not exist if that mind were not. At the same time, it must be admitted that the fact that the ultimate physical reality is nothing but a multitude of separate revolving centers of electric force also belongs to the human mind. In the apprehension of truth, there is an eternal conflict between the universal human mind and the same mind confined in the individual. The perpetual process of reconciliation is being carried on in our science, philosophy, in our ethics. In any case, if there be any truth absolutely unrelated to humanity, then for us it is absolutely non-existing. It's not difficult to imagine a mind to which the sequence of things happens not in space, but only in time like the sequence of notes and music. For such a mind, such conception of reality is akin to the musical reality, in which Pythagorean geometry can have no meaning. There is the reality of paper, infinitely different from the reality of literature. For the kind of mind possessed by the moth, which eats that paper, literature is absolutely non-existent. Yet for man's mind, literature has a greater value of truth than the paper itself. In a similar manner, if there be some truth which has no sensuous or rational relation to the human mind, it will ever remain as nothing so long as we remain human beings. Then I'm more religious than you are. My religion is a reconciliation of the superpersonal man, the universal spirit in my own individual being. Okay. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. I realize in this conversation they are essentially talking about the role of the observer in our shared reality, more specifically whether it is observer dependent or observer independent. I'm curious as to what you think about this conversation, what is your favorite part? Did you know that Albert Einstein and Rabindranath Tagore met at six different occasions and they even had a separate conversation about free will and the difference between western and eastern music? and the effect they have on a human mind. Let me know in the comments below if you want me to make a video featuring that particular conversation. So that's it for today and I hope to see you next time.